-hmm. Okay, we're going to pick right back up. Now, y'all go to the book of Acts. Let's just read again in Acts 1, verse 4 and 5 to start. We're talking about quenching the Spirit. And we're going to, it's going to take us several classes to do this because this is probably the most common spiritual attack that the devil gives us. In verse 4 it says, Being assembled together with them, of course Jesus, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, You have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So here they are waiting on the power to do this job. Now we see in the Scripture that the Holy Spirit was sent to lead, to guide, to empower, to be everything that the church needed. The word comforter doesn't mean uh, exactly like we use it of a blanket. It means a supporter, an enforcer, a, an empower, that sort of thing. So this is the job he's going to do. Well, Satan comes along, of course, and he says, appearing as an angel of light, and when, look, when you hear the term angel of light, that he transforms himself as an angel of light, don't let your mind think physical. That's typically what we do, think of a physical appearance. Typically, he comes to us in the form of knowledge, of some revelation, of some truth in Scripture that nobody else has seen. Look, when you hear a teaching and it's something new, there's your first sign to beware of it. Okay? When you can... But whenever she, uh, whenever, when you hear a teaching that comes along and it's new and you can trace it back to a certain man or a start, take a look at it. Beware of it, okay? Beware. So Satan comes as an angel of light to the church and he said, okay, very well. Here in Acts 2, you see, they all spake with tongues. And, and they spoke another language. Therefore, that's what the church is supposed to be. And he gets us out of balance. This is just one way. And he does this in all kinds of ways. Okay. So then comes the overreaction we were just talking about. And again, it's this balance that we've got to think. Imbalance is how he tends to work. Alright, I've got a pendulum here. Here's my pendulum. If I swing it out this way, it'll go equally that way. Either one of them are wrong. Where is it that we need to be? We need to be in the narrow way. Okay? Anything out of the narrow way, think about it being out of balance. So anything that he can swing us out into, he can, he can distract us from the true goal. Alright, now, since one group steps out with emotionalism, another group overreacts and they step out the other way. And this is what you can see in church history. Down through the history of the church, this is what it's been. And uh, really, the truly, what happens is, we could say this way. One group says it's all subjective. Now, in subjective, it's personal experience, right? Personal this. And, per and then the other group says, no, it's all objective. In other words, it's all just the Scripture. There is no experience. There is no feeling. One group says the Scripture doesn't matter. I feel like. How many times have y'all been told someone says, are you going to heaven? Well, yes. I say, well, what? Well, you can't tell me. I've got a feeling. I, I once was talking to a family member about what they teach for salvation. And this person told me, no, you never convinced me of that. I just feel it in my heart. I know that this is right. I feel it in my heart. Well, is that person objective or subjective? Subjective. subjective. Another person would say, huh, did you hear so-and-so? I heard that he cried. He said that he had a feeling when he got saved. It's no feeling. It's doctrine. That person's all objective. Where's the truth at? i tell you all one thing. When I got saved, there was some emotion involved. I had the weight of the world come off my shoulders and I was thrilled, right? But the point is, it's the narrow way, always. Alright, now... If we go down through church history, we'll see this all the time. I wrote some examples down. How about when Jesus came, the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Now, weren't they the perfect example? The Pharisees had completely turned from the truth of God's Word, and they had a list of, of dogma, I mean traditions. They had a, a liturgy, a, a, you know, a statement of faith. You know, churches have their articles of faith. And that becomes more important to them than the Word of God, doesn't it? And the Pharisees were all about that, weren't they? Well, what was the opposition to that? Another group swung out the other way and opposed that so strong that they went so far as to say, there is no spiritual world. There is no angels. And that's the Sadducees. And both of them were wrong, weren't they? See, that, this is kind of how it works. I had another good example would be this. The Puritans and the Quakers. 
Are you all familiar with... And then look, it's always at a time of, of when the Spirit of God works strongly that Satan works strongly. And you know, you've got a war going on. Where does the opposition send his strongest forces to? Wherever the strongest attacks at. You oppose the attack. You, you move forces over here to oppose this. Well, when the Spirit of God moves in the church in times of revival, and I don't mean these tent revivals, I mean really starts moving in the church, you'll always find the Spirit of the devil moves too. For instance, the Quakers. Are you all familiar with how the Quakers came into existence? There was a fellow, I believe his name was Fox, I forget, but it started, as so many times does, with some daughters that had a vision and that sort of thing. But what it eventually went into is the Quakers trusted what they called, uh, they, they turned from their dependence on the Spirit and on the Scripture, and they started trusting what they called uh, their promptings, their leadings, their inner light, you know, that sort of thing. In other words, their internal, we feel. And the Quakers basically got to the point where they actually said that the Word of God wasn't important. Now, you wouldn't believe that when you think of a Quaker, we think of these dogmatic, but they weren't. They were dogmatically religious, but not according to the Scriptures. I mean, they did anything but. They had the phrases of impressions of the mind. That's what they were real big on. And so what happens is they became totally subjective, didn't it? Well, then where's your standard? You are the standard if you're subjective, aren't you? You know, when I used to bodybuild, bodybuilding judge is bodybuilding judging is totally subjective. That's what makes it such a hard sport because, look, a judge sits there and let's say one judge thinks size matters more than anything. He's going to pick the biggest, thickest guy. What if another one thinks it's aesthetics and beauty? He's going to pick somebody not. Do you see what I mean? Can you argue with them? No, they're the judge. It's totally subjective. Whereas another sport, football is objective. It it was 21 to 7. We won. Period. Right? So then the, the truth is that it's in the middle where we need to be with Christianity. We need to take the Word of God and be led by the Spirit and apply it to our lives. And that's how we walk in this. And this is a daily battle. Satan is always trying to knock us off one side or the other. Haven't you ever noticed how this is the battle we fight in? Okay, so then another example of this would be with, uh, I told you all about George Whitfield, right? Everybody knows John Wesley, the Wesley brothers. Everybody knows them and started to what we call Methodists today. Well, this is the division they had. One tend to want to go more in a spiritual, trusting feelings and hat, you know that, and the others strayed from that. And what happens is it caused a rift. Now, luckily, Whitfield only stepped out a little bit and God brought him back to the center line. But what about that other group? They just kept going, folks. They wound up teaching perfectionism and that a person is to become absolutely sinless and perfect in this life or they're not a Christian. Well, what would that lead people to have? No hope, wouldn't it? See how the devil works? Do you know how all that started? Two men. Two men at the beginning of that movement. The Spirit of God was moving in a mighty way. People were, I mean, it was unbelievable what was going on. And the devil got one man, he stirred up jealousy in his heart about the ministry of the other, and guess what happened? And the whole thing split, and one group got completely led away, went into apostasy, basically. So this is how he works. Alright? Anytime we trust the impressions of our mind or that sort of thing, this is always going to lead to impulsiveness. It's always going to lead to chaos and disorder. Okay, let's say, I don't care what it is, uh, I go down in the engine, Chris is in the engine room about to fire up this 16-cylinder diesel. I go down there, and Chris is going through a startup sequence. Brand new engine's got to be broke in, right? Chris is going through a sequence. I walk down there, I said, you know, I think, you know what he's going to tell me? You think. What do you mean, you think? Nobody cares what you think. What matters is what the manual says. Mm -hmm. The manufacturer said, right? Mm -hmm. But what do we have right there in front of us? The, the manufacturer said. We got the manual, don't we? So rather than just act on an impulsive feeling, what would Chris do in every part of that startup? Well, Refer to the manual. Know. Especially if you're dealing with an engine you're not familiar with. Mm -hmm. Now once you get familiar with that engine, you wouldn't have to have the manual in front of you, but you're still following the manual mm -hmm. in your mind, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And this is how we go. Alright, so then... There's another group that says, we have the Spirit in us. So why do we need to go to a book and look for a book that was written by Him when we've got Him? Now that turned out to be the Quaker way. Well, anytime you've got somebody that's trusting feelings, what have they just done? 
They've opened the door to the devil to lead them away. Can the devil get right in our fields? Oh, Folks, that's the easiest porthole he, he can enter. He bears the Lord. He does. And so if a person doesn't trust what God said written in black and white, see, this is the danger of God said. A man says, well, God told me. Oh, wait a minute. Today, when a man says, God told me, my first script, well, give me the chapter and verse. Where did God say it at? Because otherwise, who are you having to trust? That man. Yeah. Now see, this is what happened in the first century. Basically, people denied the authority of the apostles. Did God give those apostles and prophets specific authority? Yeah, they're different than it. And anytime a man trusts his inner feelings and his own promptings or God's communicating with him, you know what he'll wind up calling himself? An apostle or a prophet. You look amongst people today that call themselves apostles or prophet so-and-so, and is their chief concern the Word of God? Oh, it's money. It's, it'll be money every time, yeah. Their chief concern will be, yeah, but God said, won't it? They say, well, God said you need to do such and such. Say, well, wait a minute. He said to Paul here, and they say, well, it doesn't matter what he said to Paul. I'm telling you what he said to me. Do you see what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Okay, by being totally subjective, they're not only putting themselves on level with the apostles and prophets, but now they're supplanting what they said, aren't they? And how did all of this come about? By not checking every thought and feeling and what we believe is God guiding us by the Scripture. Will the Holy Spirit ever go against His Word? No. Never. Now there's times when we're being prompted, we feel to do a thing, and it is of God, but we're not sure. So what do we do? You pray, you fast, you wait, you go to the Scripture. Look, folks, make it. You go to God. I want to know your will in this thing. And look to the Scripture and wait on Him. He'll show it to you. It'll come. He promised He would, didn't He? How about Israel? Did He lead them in the wilderness? Mm -hmm. Even when they rebelled against Him, did He still lead them in God? Okay. Now, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 14. You know, if you look at it down through church history, it's interesting to watch. This really is what you've got. It's no different than today. Politically speaking, don't we have this same thing going on? we got Democrats and Republicans on opposite sides, and it's, if you go back through history, there's always going to be a split group in there. There's never a unity. Well, what about in the times of church, you know, revival and reformation? The same thing. It's always this way. Satan is always at work trying to divide and set one group against another. Well, if you come back and you look at them, um, are y'all familiar with the Victorian age here in England? Queen Victoria and how they lived over there. You know what caused the Victorian? Folks, they were the most prim and proper, straight-laced, uh, cold. Y'all know that sort of thing, right? Do you know what caused that? The, re the revival that took place in the 17th century with Whitfield and all that big revival. Satan got involved and got emotionalism going. So one group stepped out against emotionalism. And it's like the church always goes down through this. If you looked at the church in general in our country today, what professes to be the church, would y'all say today that the problem is cold, indifferent adherence to legalism and liturgy, or would you say it's emotionalism and feelings and all? Emotionalism. We're on that side of it now, aren't we? And folks, the church has done this down through the ages. It, it had the great revival under Wesley, and all Satan did is, or under Whitfield and Wesley, and it had, he had one man step out with something, and emotionalism entered in, and here starts the charismatic movement. So it swings back this way, and then what happens? Real believers opposing the charismatic movement swing too far that way. And again, this is what he does over and over. Now, Paul wrote three whole chapters to the Corinthian church about this thing, but I want you to notice what he said in verse 33. He said, Ted, let's read 32 first. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Now out the window went the man that says, God did this and I couldn't control myself. God's doing this thing and there's nothing I can do. What does that say there? The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Next verse he says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now, think about where these problems were. All right, in the first century church, 
We'll just come on this side, okay? Objective on this side, subjective on this side. Who was the first century church made up of? Jews and Gentiles. Right. Right? I know it still is today, but the mixing back then was more even to start, wasn't it? What would the Jewish mindset be? Emotional, spiritual? No. no. Dry legalism, right? But what about the pagans? Just the opposite. Hooping and hollering and cutting themselves with stones and you know all that sort of stuff. It, well, Paul's writing to the Corinthians and of course they've taken the gifts and they've gone that emotional route. And he writes three whole chapters to address them. But look what he says in verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Now, how can you do anything in order if you don't have marching orders? Now, I know people say in order just means organized. No, it doesn't. In order means according to the orders. Paul gave ordinances, and that's not just the Lord's Supper and Baptism, as people say. Ordinances are those things which are ordered. Did Paul show them how to order their churches? Mm -hmm. He showed them how to do it, didn't he? Well, did they do that in the book of Acts? Yes. But what happened? They started doing things disorderly. Now, as soon as you do something disorderly, what does that mean? You're no longer going according to some order, right? So you're stepping out of, out of bounds with it. All right, that's a logical thing that this took place amongst the, you know, the paganisms. But the opposite of the, fo the, the false emotionalism is not no emotion. No emotion. In other words, people today, we deal with the charismatic movement a lot, don't we? Does everybody see that stuff that they do and realize, hey, this is something, this just ain't right? You can see it, can't you? Is it in order or is it confusion? It's utter confusion. Imagine someone standing up and blabbering about in gibberish for five minutes and then another person's claiming they've got the interpretation and the interpretation does not agree with the Word of God. Does that sound like the Holy Spirit? Well, what happens is, you know, we laugh and it's understandable, but folks, people believe that, don't they? But then people like us laugh at it and we tend to go too far the other way. Anytime someone says, well, the Spirit, we say, oh boy, here we go. You see how simple that is? And you can get out of line with it, can't you? And this is what Satan does again. Now, it seems again in our country that we're currently going through the, the more emotional thing. Now, look at how they do it. What are different ways that Satan uses to stir emotion? You all know the most common? Music. Music. Now, I don't mean you can't have music. David and they had music, didn't they? What I mean is, what kind of music and how do they use it? Y'all noticed? Think about it. Everybody's seen these new... new. Have y'all seen the new, look like a disco club churches? They got light shows and they got, you know, big, big things and they're playing and what are the people out there doing? Dance. Right? Folks, that looks more like ELO than church, doesn't it? Cheap, but you see what I mean? What does that do? It gets the emotions going. Alright, what's another uh, prime characteristic of that stuff? No offense, women. Women. Now why? Why are women at the forefront? They're more emotional. And this is how they get these kind of things going. Folks, you get somebody emotional. Okay? What do you reckon would be the cause of a man in charge of one of those services wanting to get people emotional? What are they more likely to do when they're emotional? Give them more money. Give them more money. You got it. He, I, I probably told y'all this story already, but to, you know, emotional. We were watching a Roseanne one time, and their dad had died. Roseanne and her sister, and her sister was she was the funny one, Jackie. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they they took they were Jackie and Roseanne's husband went to the place and the man's trying to sell him a casket, right? Mm -hmm. And the girl's crying and Dan's trying to help her and the man said, well, this one looks, Dan said, this one looks good. She said, okay, that one. And the man said, well, that one will be fine. I mean, if you don't mind putting it in there. It so happens I am. Yeah. But you see what I mean? What was he doing? He, she was emotional. He said, well, I mean, this is your father. I mean, if you don't mind him spending the rest of his life in pine. I mean, I certainly don't, but... You know, I, these are for the, those that love their parents more. You see, they take it. Y'all know what a funeral costs, don't you? There ain't a bigger mm -hmm. scam in this world than that, folks. Yeah. I mean, seriously. So then they, he, he starts trying to sell her on the top model, right? And Dan's the way, oh, wait, 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 trying to pull her back in. And finally she said, all right, now look, I'm going to tell you something. I am an emotional train wreck right now. 
and I'm liable to buy anything that you sell me. And the man smiled, she said, and I'm also just as likely to pull a 357 out of my purse and blow your head off. <laughs> See, that was a condition she was in, right? But that's kind of what they do. They get people in emotional. When you get folks emotional, they will believe things they wouldn't normally believe. Y'all ever been caught up in the emotion of something and later you're telling somebody and they're just looking at you and what do we say? Well, you had to be there. Ain't that what we say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the same thing they say about the... Uh, someone told me recently, said, we had the most incredible service this morning. It was just the most incredible. So I said, well, that's wonderful. What did y'all study? Uh, huh? Uh, I said, well, what was y'all studying? She said, this person said, uh, what, what do you mean? I said, well, mm -hmm. where were you at in the Bible? What was the topic? What were you doing? Oh, it wasn't like that. <laughs> but you see how that is? Yeah. And I said, well, what was it like? And she told me about the Spirit was moving. You could feel Him in that building. Well, I don't doubt a Spirit was moving. But folks, it was not the Spirit of God. Now, how do you know that? Because it says, He will testify of me. The, the, late, the person described the whole process. And when I got, she got done, I said, what about Jesus Christ and Him crucified? And she said, what? I said, what about Christ crucified? It never came up then how's that the Holy Spirit? It's not. Those people leave those type meetings and what do they go out and say? I drew closer to the Lord today by seeing the love that He had for me when He died on, on Calvary. No. Do they say, I can't believe the sacrifice the Father made for a worm like me? They come out of those meetings saying, I'm special in God's eyes. He loves me. God, I'm somebody. I'm really something. Matter of fact, I, you should have felt the Spirit moving today. I'm or I went to church. Or I went to church. Yeah. I mean, it's all that kind of yeah. thing, isn't it? Do you see how that's just emotional? Okay, that's totally subjective, right? So what happens on the other side? Just the opposite. Look, I have been part of a church that is, fits this side over here more than any group I've ever met. They're, they deny the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They say the Holy Spirit is only when the church meets where two or three are gathered. That's only how it is. There's absolutely the idea that God would heal someone. That can't be. I mean, everything is cold and heartless and calculated. It's just, it's, it's formal. And all the people there can ever say is that they're, they're, the idea is that they want to get somebody to join the church. And you say, well, what is it that y'all teach? Well, we teach the Bible. Well, great. Tell me what you believe. Well, we believe the Bible. Well, tell me what you believe. See, that doesn't bring you to know Jesus Christ, does it? Mm -hmm. Folks, neither one of them are right. One's not more wrong than the other. The truth is, yes, God uses our emotions. If you can look me in the eyes and tell me that when you close your eyes and you think about Jesus Christ suffering and crucified on that cross for me, if you tell me that doesn't stir up any emotion in you, I wonder what it is you're seeing. Right? Someone says, well, here we go again with the feelings. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm like the man that wrote the song, At the Cross, At the Cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. Does God not tell us these things? See, then this is why we've got to be so careful. Satan is always trying to get us out of bounds. And remember, if you're in a fight, I don't care how strong the man is. If you can get him to lean over on one foot, what can you do? Push him over. You can knock him over. I used to work out with a football player from Washington State when I was up in, uh, in the Navy in Washington. He got drafted by the Redskins. Man, he was a big old good friend. His name was Bob. And back then, Reggie White. Remember Reggie White? Yeah. Reggie White had the swim move, they called it. Remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Had guy come to go, and he swing that arm over and hit him and push him right by the right quarterback he'd had him. And I told Bob one day, I said, what if I go to, he was showing me something, I said, well, what if I swim you? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He said, go ahead. And so I reared up to do this, and oh, as soon God. as I did, he took that hand right here and hit me right there and knocked me on the floor. He didn't hit me hard as he could. He just took, it was like, he got like he was in a stance, and I thought I was going to do something. He said, go ahead and swim me. When you lift that arm up, what naturally happens? You're out of balance. All my weight's on this foot. Look at the back foot. He just took that hand and knocked me right over. He said, that's all you got to do to a swim. I said, yeah, but if it was some bigger guy, he said, it don't matter. The bigger they are, the easier they're going to fall. The more weight you've got on that foot, the easier, right? Folks, this is the same thing the devil does. He gets us out of balance. Now, how do you and I make sure that we maintain balance? 
We've got the Word of God. We've got prayer. We've got meditation. Look, use your scriptural common sense. If a thing doesn't seem right, don't act on it. Go to the Scriptures and wait on God. Ask Him. Show Him. If you got a big decision to make, tell the Lord, I don't know what to do. I need you to guide me here. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and all the other things will be added unto you. That doesn't mean I had a family member that used to quote that when he was robbing me. I said, how can you possibly justify what you're doing here? And he said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. In other words, join the church and make sure you're there when the doors open and you can rob and steal. God will make you rich. That's just another version of prosperity gospel, isn't it? What it really means is set your mind on God and serving Him and He'll work out the rest of it. Folks, if God wants you to be successful, you're going to be successful. If God doesn't want that to be your bailiwick, you won't be. He, I, I use Ralph all the time. I don't care what Ralph did. Ralph come out successful. Well, Ralph said, I don't even know how it happened. Well, later on he knew how it happened. The Lord had it. There's other people that say, I just can't, no matter what, I always wind up back here. Well, think about that. If you are sincere in serving the Lord and you keep trying to go in one direction and you always wind back where you started, what would that tell you? You're going in the wrong direction. You keep going in the wrong direction. This is where the Lord wants you. It's kind of simple like that. All right, now, how about quenching the Spirit through attacks on His deity? The first was in balance, okay? The second is by attacking the Holy Spirit personally. I'm not going to spend much time on this. and there, I'm not certainly telling you all I've got all of them. These are just some I've got. But I want you all to think about it this way. Have you all read a lot of the new translations? What they refer to the Spirit as? It. It. Right away, what did that just do? Diminished. It diminished the deity of the Holy Spirit. There are others that refer to the Holy Spirit as an influence. An influence. What is that? Not a Folks, that is not a person. The Holy Spirit is called a He. Okay? Him. He, he's, he's the third person in, in the Trinity, in the Godhead. Okay? So then, does the Holy Spirit have some inferior role as far as godliness? No. He's performing a duty today, isn't He? But you can't call Him inferior. How could you call the Holy Spirit inferior to the Son when the Son died on the cross? That would seem inferior, wouldn't it? But then you can't call that inferior because He's going to be glorified for all time, isn't He? So some would say, well, then you're telling me that the Father is taking inferior position because the Father's given all the glory to the Son. Yeah, and what loving Father don't want to sit and watch His Son receive everything? Mm. You see, it's perfect. The whole plan is perfect, right? So then these attacks on the Holy Spirit. Jesus called Him Him and He. And the teaching of the New Testament is that the Holy Spirit is a person, okay? It said, Jesus said, He shall be in you. Right? Shall be in you. Alright, so go over to uh, 1 Corinthians 6. Alright, in 1 Corinthians 6, verse uh, 19. We'll read 18 first. Flee fornication. You'd say, why? Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now consider for a second here. Do we believe that the Holy Spirit the person of the Holy Spirit really takes up residence in us. That's what the Scripture teaches. You know, if me and you would really consider that, we'd think a lot harder about some of the things we do and say, wouldn't we? I once heard an old preacher, someone asked him if he wanted a shot of whiskey. He said, well, hold on, let me ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you like a slug? Now that sounded real stupid, didn't it? But that's what he was trying to do. Make a, and um, look, if you... 
if whiskey is your thing, I'm not trying to single anybody out and pick them. I just want to show you if I believe I've got the Holy Spirit in me everywhere I go, where am I, who am I bringing? I mean, who in the world would want to take your wife to some of the places you've been? Man, I've been some place. Look, when I was in the Navy, I think of a couple places I went that I definitely would not want to take anybody I cared about. Right, Mr. Adam? Mm -hmm. You get in the Navy, you get, you get in some places you don't want to go yourself again. A point is, can you and I uh, oppose the Spirit or quench the work of the Spirit by basically rendering ourselves useless? Yeah. yeah, we can. We can all do this. But it's the attacks on the person that I want to show you. If I don't believe the Holy Spirit is an actual person, doesn't that lessen my desire for sanctification? It, it, it affects it, doesn't it? So then Satan not only tries to get us out of balance, but he tries to lessen our opinion of the Holy Spirit. In lessening your opinion, look, if you think less of someone, aren't you going to act differently towards them? How about if you think more of them? He, I, look, when I was growing up, I was raised in a culture where drinking was, was normal, everybody was drunk, and everybody cussed like you wouldn't believe. Man, I knew words that I, I, I just, I should, kid my age, you never should have known. But do y'all know, I never said one of them words around my granny. I just never use that kind of language around her. I use it around my dad. I even use it in front of my mom. I wouldn't use it in front of my granny. Now why not? She set a standard. She, that's exactly right. Yeah. It, it, you say, well, it's because you loved her more. Well, that was the end result, but the point is, she wouldn't have any of it. If I said something like that in front of her, I knew that stuff, that, that right there, don't go around her, right? Shouldn't we think about the Holy Spirit in that manner? Mm. Hey, this kind of thing, don't go around Him. Well, when are you without Him? Never. Never, okay? Alright, so that's just one other one I want to talk about now. How about Satan quenches the Spirit by corrupting his abode? Now, what is the abode of the Spirit today? In you. We are, right? We are. Why do you think Paul just said flee fornication? Imagine one of these Corinthians going over to the Diana temple thinking, I think I, I got time, lunch, and I'm going to go get a temple prostitute. I can be back. I've got an hour. Who's he taking with him? You see what I mean? I mean, it's the same today. Someone said, well, now it's not about this. It's about just as simple as it is. It's about the corrupting of the vessel. Go to 2 Timothy 2. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 19, Paul says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now watch the explanation. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet or fit for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So are we to keep our vessels prepared? But can we corrupt them? Look at the next verse. Flee youthful lusts. Then what would the youthful lusts do? Corrupt the vessel. Y'all remember in the Old Testament what happened with Israel? All right. Y'all remember the fella had the, uh, uh, Eli had the two sons over in the beginning of the book of 1 Samuel. Eli was the high priest. He had two sons. He didn't raise his sons according to the word of God, did he? So what kind of sons were they? They were, they were rotten and they were stealing from the things of God, weren't they? Remember them? They were getting out the best of everything for themselves. Well, they took the ark to go to war and what did they find out? God wasn't with them. They got out there and lost the ark, and the lady heard about it and named the child she had Ichabod. It means God has departed. The glory is gone. Why did God depart them? They turned from Him. Yeah. Folks, they were dirty and filthy. They got mixed in with idols, didn't they? You come later on to the temple. When Solomon set up the temple, they purified it and got it all finished, and the glory of God came and dwelt in it, didn't it? Later on, Ezekiel shown a vision. The glory of God leaves out of the holy 
of holies goes out to the outer tent and sits on the wall and then it leaves and goes to the door and then finally it goes up to the pinnacle of the tent and then finally it's gone, doesn't it? They watch the glory of the Lord depart the temple. Well, why is that? What did Ezekiel see in the temple next? Idols set up, paintings of every kind of false god, sun worship. In other words, because they corrupted God's dwelling, what did God do? He left. Now think about how Satan can oppose or quench the spirit. And we're going to get into it. The main meaning, I say the, next week we'll get into the main meaning of quench is, is dealing with fire. When I think of quench, I think thirst. You know what I mean? Satisfy. But the word literally means put out a fire. Okay? And the Holy Spirit is often compared to fire. But think about it. How would Satan quench the activity of the Spirit? What does he know about God's Spirit? The Holy Spirit. What does holy mean? Set apart. Well, is he going to be able to abide in that which is filthy and corrupt? Look, it's the same thing Satan did back here at the beginning. Nothing's new. How did Satan get Adam? Folks, Satan can't do nothing to Adam that God don't. God blessed Adam. Can Satan curse what God blessed? The Bible says he can't, doesn't it? So what did he do? He got around that, didn't he? How did he get around it? He got Adam to bring the curse on himself, didn't he? I mean, think about how it happened. He couldn't force him, could he? So he went through the weaker vessel, the more emotional. When he got her involved, he led her astray. She led Adam astray. And basically what happened? Satan said, God is holy and righteous and just. He cannot behold iniquity. If I can get this man right here to get his vessel dirty, God will depart him. And what happened? That's what happened. And is he doing any different with the church over here today? You look down through church history and what you'll find is she starts out blazing. And then what happens? She gets worldly and corrupt. The Lord comes along. I'm not saying she ever disappears. The, world come, the Lord comes along and raises her up. And I don't mean she ever goes out of existence. I just mean it's cyclical. It's just like the seasons. Things look bright and alive and glow, and then they go down. Then they come back, and the church is no different. God raises her up revival and mighty works of the Spirit, and she slowly goes down again, doesn't she? We finally get over to a point over here where God raises her up in glory, and it's just about time to take her. And what do you find then? When she's reached her greatest glory, you find her greatest fall, don't you? And what follows her greatest fall? God raises her up one last time to be with Him. And this is how it goes. That's how it goes in Scripture. Look at Israel's history. Look at men. It's always this way. Alright, so then there's another way it can happen. Let's go look at one more. Go back to uh, uh, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Alright, in verse, uh, let's see, 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying, now, there was a time I, I was taught and I believed that, well, this can't just mean lying. It, it, nobody uh, has ever put away lying. This is talking about some kind of spiritual line. But keep it simple. What is lying? lying. It's lying. Put away lying. We got no business lying. Put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Okay? Can you imagine your right hand lying to your left hand? That don't make any sense. It's got the same blood, the same everything, right? But what about one member of Christ lying to another? It's the same thing. So he says next, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. How is that tied to giving place to the devil? Don't. It, it, it's, it's dark for sure, but y'all think about how, how should we forgive? each other quickly and instantaneously mm -hmm. right what happens when we don't we suffer. 
It's on further. It comes on further. That's right. You know, you you uh, you have. Uh, let's say you and your wife have uh, crosswords, right? Time to go to bed, you have crosswords. You don't say I'm sorry before you go to bed. You wake up the next morning, what's it What's it like? Still there. It's still there, it's still right? But before you go to bed, if you say you're sorry and get away, you wake up to that, you see what I mean? Yeah. You don't let that sort of thing fester. It's like a canker, isn't it? So he said, don't give place to the devil. Verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him uh, labor, working with his own hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Now, does that justify communism? It's not talking about communism. Who is he that needeth? But what is needeth? What do we need? Y'all know what we're taught today. We're taught that you work that I can have the thing that he can have what he wanteth. Is that what we're taught? Yeah, but that's, not the that's not what it is. Who in the Bible were those that were needed? Who was the tithe for, for instance? The blind, the widows, the fatherless, those that could not do for themselves. What about the man that can do for himself and would rather wait on others? Paul said, don't give that man nothing. Y'all know we've had to deal with this thing right here in our group. We've had to deal with this sort of thing. You will have people that recognize compassion and charity of Christians, so what do they say? Not take advantage of no, this. Yeah, 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 I mean, it'll happen. Thank God we don't have this problem anymore, but we've had it before. Mm -hmm. Y'all might not even be aware of it. Some, some of us are aware. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you got to deal with it. And it, it will become a real problem, become a real issue. Well, you find out that when you deal with it, whether the person is sincere or not. Now, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Well, what would that mean? No corrupt communication means what? No corrupt. No corrupt communication. Okay, none. So what? Would basically, what does that say? Are you well? That I can have corrupt communications with this one or no? None. I don't know how to make it any plainer than what it is. Don't steal. Don't lie. In other words, be be forthright and upright. Ready? Right? Now he says next. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So then what should every word that we should consider, does it tear down or build up? Y'all yeah. know I generally, when I go to Montgomery on Fridays, I always get to the Dolly Parton Bridge. And I, I can't help it, I look over that way and there's Axis over there. And so immediately I'm thinking about Mr. Al and Maddie. I'm looking over there and I wonder, so I always find myself texting Mr. Al on Friday. You know what I have learned? He's always going to say something back to me that's edifying. Mm -hmm. Even if things aren't going well, he's going to say, well, I, I have this problem and that problem, but praise the Lord, something's always edifying. Mm -hmm. And that, hey, that builds you up, doesn't it? Y'all got anybody? Y'all remember the, uh, the winders on Saturday Night Live? Y'all remember them? Y'all remember? How are you doing? Uh, I'm not doing the Jane Turton. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. yeah. Right, you ever talk to somebody that's just down and up? Nobody wants to talk to them, do they? Well, that ain't certainly how a Christian ought to be acting. We ought not be, you know, we ought to be always forward and positive. But he says now, verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now notice grieve. Grieve is a little bit different than quench. To quench it is to quench his work, his activities, the things he's doing. But to grieve is more personal. If I if I quench something Lexi's doing, I, I stop some work she has going on, right? But if I grieve Lexi, I've offended her person. I hurt her personally, right. hadn't I? Well, then what happens when we corrupt our vessel? We grieve the Holy Spirit. Would any loving husband like to have to leave his wife? Or vice versa? But does the Holy Spirit, I don't mean you're, you're lost, but does the Holy Spirit ever have to depart our vessel as far as in the usefulness of it? We grieve the Spirit, don't we? We ought not do that. Hey, we're going to stop there, but we're going to keep picking this up. and we're gonna, Hold on, Lexi. Sienna, come here. Sienna will be on the camera. Show everybody your dress today. You ready? There you go. Now wave to the camera. You're on the camera. There you go. 